Um, today, I had the great pleasure of introducing Tan Van uh from the University of Copenhagen. So I have to admit, it's a special pleasure to get to introduce somebody from a home man because it allows me to say things like "Welcome, Grandi." Really, you know, it's a head of the abbot, so it's in the So I glad to see you here more seriously, it is a pleasure to introduce Karen Van Gorder, whose work on families, children, emotions, colonial encounters, and education meshes so incredibly beautifully with many of the, of the talks we've had this year and the themes in general that we've been exploring over the past nine months. <clears throat> Karen Van Gorder received her MA and her PhD from the University of Copenhagen, where she's now an assistant professor. See, at the University of Copenhagen, they know to keep the best to themselves. <laughs> um, Khan is an immensely productive scholar, and I, I have to have this cheat sheet. She's an immensely productive scholar with a very long list of publications, both of um, academic articles, but also of newspaper columns and newspaper articles. In addition to that, she's the author of the book called Imperial Childhoods and Christian Mission. And I have a copy of the book that I will pass around. In a second. There it is. <laughs> thought I had it. <laughs> um, the subtitle for the book is Education and Emotions in South India and Denmark. Uh, it was published by Pelgrave in, 19, in 2014. Khan is also the co-editor with uh, Claire Bakliski and Daniel McIndena of Emotions and Christian Mission, Historical Perspectives. That was published by Pelgrave in 2015. Um, in addition to that, Khan has been keeping Palgrave busy with yet another publication. She's one of the central contributors to the book that recently appeared that's called Childhood, Youth and Emotions in Modern History, National, Colonial and Global Perspectives, published in 2015. Right now, Khan is working on a new project about the history of emotions studied through uh, divorce records in Denmark from the 1880s to the present. But uh, today what she's going to talk about is <coughs> her work on uh, India. And her talk is, as you can see, called The Childhood, Childhood and the Ambiguous Policies of Love. So thank you very much, Tanya. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tina. And uh, thank you for hosting me here and inviting me here. Um, and not least for making things that for my daughter, which is <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. And I also want to thank Inky Freeman, who isn't here, for volunteering to do that. Um, it's really great. And thank you all of you for coming here and abandoning the sunshine. As Pegida said, I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and comments toward the end, or even if you want to butt in um, as I go, uh, go on. But do you want to switch on the mic? Oh. <laughs> the second switch there. I'll do that. And just one more thing. If you don't mind, if I'm sending an attendance sheet around just so we have a sense of the folks that are here and the disciplines you come from. So please sign up. Second. Oh, yeah, there's second. Which yeah. second? There you go. That's it. <laughs> oh, actually, it's going to be really hard to see my manuscript. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll work. We'll see. If I can't read what I've written, then maybe we'll, we'll turn it back on. Yeah. Good. This is Kamala. Uh, a Tamil girl whose mother took her to the Danish missionaries uh, in 1897 when she was just a baby. She was then brought up by a number of different foster parents until she was a young woman. Kamala's story, or rather the little bits of it that we can trace through the archives, the missionary archives, convey a changing emotional culture of childhood in the Danish missionary community in South India around the turn of the 20th century. It also gives insight into the somewhat equivocal and heterogeneous effects that uh, this change in emotional culture had on the power relationships uh, between different categories of adults and children in this context. And in the course of the next approximately 45 minutes, through the lens of Kamala's story, I will make the case that during the end of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century, a particular sentimentalized notion of childhood became critical to the Danish missionaries' involvement with South Indians. I'm going to try to make four related points. Um, the first is that in the last decades of the 20th century, missionary attitudes towards children changed dramatically. Whereas during the 1860s and 1870s, the missionaries perceived Indian children as sinful little heathens, 
They now began to describe them as innocent and delightful little beings who were to be treated with scientifically informed care and gently guided with loving patience. As love became uh, celebrated as the ideal means of education, Indian children, one might say, were inscribed into a universal category of the child. This universalized notion of childhood had ambiguous socio-political effects. In one way, love became a mode of inclusion. Indian children were, to a large extent, included in the missionaries' collectivity, or affected community, if you like. This also meant being subjected to an emotional regime, which may have been rather more difficult to contest than a more severe disciplinary one would have been. At the same time, the distribution and supposed capability of love reinforced other social boundaries. Indian adults, who were presumably incapable of proper parental love, became defined as fundamentally different from the enlightened, compassionate, and loving European Christians. In this way, the sentimentalized understanding of childhood also became a way, in this context as in many others, I believe, of defining what it meant to be modern, civilized, or European. It also meant, and this is my last point, that the missionaries employed the modern notion of childhood as a way of justifying imperialist interventions. So this is a menu. It won't be presented in exactly this order necessarily, but this, these are the points that I'm, I'm going to make. Here's a picture of the Danish missionaries on an outing in the hill station of Kotagri. Uh, in the early 20th century. Why, you might ask, should we take interest in these missionaries from this little peripheral country in Northern Europe? <laughs> Aside from the fact that this is where Birgitta was born, of course. <laughs> Why would we be interested in their work in South India? And I wouldn't blame you for asking that. But my answer would be that even though this was a highly local and in some ways rather isolated contact zone, what happened here, and in other encounters like it, not only reflected, but also very likely contributed to the modern conception of childhood that was emerging in Europe and North America at the time. In recent decades, post-colonial scholars demonstrated, have demonstrated again and again that Europe was constituted through mutual, though invariably asymmetrical, relationships between metropoles and colonies. So what happened in the colonies affected the development within Europe more than we've been used to thinking. But we need to keep in mind that the making of modern Europe happened not just through relations between larger colonial powers like Britain, the Netherlands, or France and their colonies. It also happened through other types of transnational interactions in a variety of imperial settings, including between people from smaller colonial powers and non-colonizing nations all across the globe. The Inter-Danish encounter, I think, is a case in point. At different times from the 17th century to the middle of the 20th century, Denmark counted colonial possessions on the African Gold Coast, in the Caribbean, uh, and in India, as well as in Greenland, Iceland, and the Faroe Islands. But in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Danish Christian missionaries in India occupied a rather marginal position in relation to the British colonial power there. Yet, through their exchanges with different South Indian peoples, and through their textual production and social work directed at a Danish audience, they participated with great eagerness in the cultural labor that went into the production of modern Europe through its colonial entanglements. The new sentimentalized notion of childhood that emerged in the Danish South Indian mission field at the end of the 19th century can also be seen in this light. It not only mirrored the new ideas and practices of childhood within Europe, <laughs> It may also have helped disseminate those ideas and propel those practices. So before we get back to Kamala, let me give you just a brief introduction to the Danish mission in South India. Um, so this is the, Indian, the, the southern tip of the Indian subcontinent, and the Danish mission uh, was, uh, took place mostly in the South Arctic district on the eastern uh, part of, um, of South India, the South Indian um, tip there. Um, by the tip of the continent, subcontinent. Um, and the Danish Missionary Society was an interdenominational society which enjoyed support from members all over Denmark. In addition to South India, it also had mission posts in Greenland and China. And the missionaries 
like to think of themselves as part of a global movement at this time, seeking to conquer the peoples of the world in the name of God's kingdom. And they did this through preaching, building churches, uh, and engaging in various kinds of social work. Here you see a Danish missionary in the late 19th century on uh, a preaching tour, and you can see the ox cart that he traveled in at the back, and this was the tent that he then put up in different places to go around preaching to convert the heathen. In their work, these Christian agents hoped to reach people from different layers of Indian society, and in fact, especially valued high caste converts. But their work mostly attracted people from the bottom of the social scale in rural South India. The majority of those who were interested in what the mission had to offer were poor and socially stigmatized, many of them toiling as debt slaves for higher caste landlords. They presumably hoped that the mission could offer a way to a better life, but they were also much more vulnerable to missionary interventions than people who were more well-off socially and economically. Now, ever since the society became engaged in its first mission in South India in 1864, children occupied a central place on their agenda. They debated questions of childhood and education in their publications, and they spent impressive resources trying to raise Indian children to become good human beings and to make them into grown-ups who knew their place in the specific colonial hierarchies predicated on gender, caste, nationality, and religion. Here you see a picture of uh, a Christian boarding school for girls where their children are about to take a meal. And you can see the missionary wife sitting there in white and an elevated position in relation to the children. Um, and another one, the one from the flyer. Uh, again, you can see the missionary wife wearing white and in an elevated position. And here, the same goes for the missionary child. So that was, that was quite common in these portrayals that the missionary would stand out um, and her superior position in a way would be underscored. And, and the same, of course, in some cases at least with the Danish children. Now, during the first decades of their engagement, as I said before, which is to say during the 1860s and 70s, most missionaries conceived of Indian children as essentially, and perhaps even irredeemably, heathen. Although individual children could display commendable qualities, so the missionaries said, Indian children were generally corrupt and sinful. They were lazy, over-sexualized, and they had an inclination to lie, cheat, and steal without shame. Even the children whom the missionaries took into their care and raised at their boarding schools proved inferior to European children. For example, the German missionary Karl Ox, who worked for the Danish Missionary Society at the time, expressed this perception quite succinctly when he stated, Between European and Hindu children, there is a great difference. Three of the former make more noise than twelve of the latter. The former, the European, learn more slowly and for a longer time and remember it better than the latter, who mature early, learn easily, but soon cease to make progress and quickly forget. The former are usually straightforward, open, and free. The latter, the Indian, are delicate, conceal as much as possible, and do not easily achieve any level of independence. The note that the Hindu children whom Kalaks refers to here were in fact both baptized and brought up as Christians by the missionaries, so their Hinduness is predicated not uh, so much on their religious affiliation as on their nationality or race. And the differences that Karl Ox outlined here refers, uh, uh, were in fact, uh, sorry, <laughs> refers, uh, uh, corresponds rather well to the, to the differences that most colonial observers believed to exist among Indian, Indian and European adults at the time. And here's a picture of the children, or a drawing of the children that Karl Ox was describing and their two school teachers. Paradoxically, although the missionaries declared that Indian children soon ceased to make progress, they invested remarkable resources in trying to make them into true and respectable Christians, according to an ideal derived primarily from a European context. Karl Ox and his contemporaries were convinced that in order to raise and educate children to their highest potential, they had to be raised with strict methods and, if necessary, with serious corporal punishment. In one example, Karl Ox described how he had beat, bound, and locked children up, but with disappointing results. And in terms of the emotional culture around the children, 
Fear and shame at this time were important tools of education. While disappointment and frustration were some of the primary emotions that the missionaries associated with the work of converting children. What seemed particularly disturbing to the missionaries at this time was that Indian children were unchildlike. By lying, cheating, and stealing, they sinned just like adults, and they were eerily unable to play. So for that reason, the missionaries advised their supporters back in Denmark uh, against sending toys because they said Indian children didn't know how to play, so they wouldn't know how to use these toys. And this sort of recalls what historian Shata Drusen has argued that a lot of colonial observers believe that the idea of the native child was an oxymoron. <coughs> yeah. But toward the end of the century, significant changes occurred in the missionaries' rhetoric about children. Now they increasingly began to see the children as delightful, charming, and even lovable little individuals. This is a uh, portrayal of Kamala, and as you can see, she's rather romantically portrayed as a flower. Um, and, and it's a focus on the individual child, which you didn't see much of earlier in the 19th century. As I mentioned, Kamala was brought to the Danish mission when she was an infant. When the missionary sister Sara, who took her into foster care, returned permanently to Denmark six months later, she found an Indian Christian family willing to take Kamala. Kamala was then, then, then stayed with that family until she was five years old. At that point, the newly arrived missionary, Augusta Nuok, decided to take Kamala back into the mission and raise her as her own daughter. She did so, slightly anxious about the fact that she didn't yet speak the language that Kamala spoke, um, but she was convinced that the Lord would assist her in the task. And she describes uh, Kamala's uh, first uh, arrival at the mission station in, in a rather long quote, which I hope you'll forgive me for, for um, quoting uh, in its entirety, because I think it's, it's really worth it. She says, Kamala promptly ran, ran across the veranda into the illuminated sitting room. Under her arm, she carried all her belongings, which consisted in a sewing box. She immediately began to show us the contents of the box, which in her eyes were great splendors, namely a pink apron, a thimble, and a string of pearls. She quickly became familiar with us. However, some tears did fall in the evening as she was going to bed, but they soon stopped after the foster father, who stayed with us for a couple of days, went and lay down to sleep on the floor next to her. When her foster father was leaving, Kamala told him, you can leave now, and I promise to write if I wish to go home again. As soon as he was gone, I sent for a barber and let the entire curly wig be cut off. I figured that was the best way to get to the bottom of things. After that, she was given a proper bath with soap, which actually made her skin lighter. Oh, how she's been a great joy and amusement to me already. She filled the space, which felt empty for me in the first year out here, that is to say, to possess something. As you can see, this description is very different from the one Carl Ox gave in, of Indian children a little more than three decades earlier. It reflects a new kind of attention to the charming peculiarities of the child, such as Kamala's unrestrained movements, her joy and pride in her few possessions, her spontaneous and direct personality, and the confidence she showed in her new foster mother, as well as in her own capacity to decide where she was going to live. <coughs> Augusta Nuevo also signaled alertness to Kamala's feelings as she recounted how the child had cried on her first night in the new and foreign place. And the fact that the foster father was invited to stay for a few days while Kamala was getting used to the place also indicates a consideration for the girl's sense of security. In the description, the cutting off of Kamala's hair and the bath function almost as a kind of baptism, a ritual initiation into her new life which uh, was kind of uh, symbolized by the kind of wide and clean, uh, clean life that the missionaries lived, and in contrast to native living. Um, and as Foster Mother also said, you know, it almost changed her racial status as it made her skin look lighter. But perhaps most importantly, Augusta Nubop declared her affection for Kamala, emphasizing how she brought her joy and filled an empty space created by an unfulfilled emotional need. This intimate mother-daughter relationship was one of possession. Having taken Kamala from her foster parents, she now in a sense owned her. And tellingly, 
there's no mention of what it might have been like for the foster father to leave his child with a white woman who was a total stranger to him. And here is a picture of Augusta Nigel and Kamala shortly after her wife arrival. You can see her hair is still short um, after having been cut off. And the picture is sort of designed to show an intimacy uh, between the missionary and the child and also uh, to show the missionary listening attentively to what the child is, t is telling her. In the letter and in this photo, we see the signs of a new emotional culture of the child, which spread in the Danish community from the 1890s onward. One that constituted the child as the object of tender feelings and deserving of protection and care. When the missionaries compared Indian children to European children, they now emphasized similarities rather than differences. Indian children, they said, were pretty, cute, well-behaved, lovely, delightful, and as in uh, Augusta Nyrup's case, they often said how they filled, the children filled their missionary lives with joy. In fact, the, Indians, the Indian children's supposedly particularly childlike qualities now came to more or less outweigh those negative characteristics associated with their race or their racial status. This is what I mean to say when I say that uh, the universal child, or the Indian child became inscribed in the universal category of the child and that in a sense childhood was universalized in the process. The sentimentalization of childhood was not uh, particular to the Danish South Indian context. Uh, historians working on many different contexts have shown how this happened uh, across Europe and North America as ideas of original sin had been discarded and as families uh, relied less and less on children's contribution to the household economy. Children now became objects of sentiment uh, in Viviana Celis's work. And qualities such as innocence, cheerfulness and the capacity for uncritical love came to define the, ch the child and children were increasingly sort of culturally cherished for enriching their parents' lives on an emotional level. In her work on the cultural production of childhood innocence in the 19th and early 20th centuries uh, America, Robin Bernstein argues that this innocence was raised white. Indeed, she says, black juveniles were excluded from the category of the child. White children became constructed as tender angels, while black children were libeled as unfeeling, non-innocent, non-children. In the Indo-Danish context, something similar was the case in the 1860s and 70s, um, as we've already seen with Karl Ox's quote. But around the turn of the 20th century, missionaries went far to assert that brown-skinned Indian children were just as innocent and sweet as the European. And lovable as they were, they also had to be loved. They had to be raised with tenderness, patience, and care. And you see a girl on a swing. No longer, um, no longer are the children play, uh, are described as unable to play. The missionaries no longer endorsed corporal punishment as means of education. Instead, they frequently talked about winning the hearts of the children and about securing their confidence and love. This also implied a different educational atmosphere in which the missionaries sought to create opportunity for the children to play and have fun. As this picture show, and the next couple of pictures will show, uh, the, the, this idea that children couldn't play kind of had disappeared altogether. So here's a girl in a swing, and here you see a drawing of boarding school boys uh, playing soccer. So now they had much more leisure time, whereas in the 1860s and 70s they would work uh, when they didn't go to school most of the time. But now they made sure that there was leisure for them, or leisure time for them to play. And here they had, the missionaries have taken the boarding school boys on an excursion, and you can see them playfully bathing in the river. Now, one of the key aspects of the missionary descriptions in images and words of the new childhood culture is that they were not always just about the Indian children. They were also about the missionaries themselves. Now, missionaries described themselves as capable of extending the right kind of love to the Indian children. Just to give you one example, uh, here is missionary Viggo Müller's portrayal of a high caste boy who attended the boarding school that he ran in the temple town of Tirumbanamalai. He writes, strong and well-built as he is, and with his characteristic face surrounded by thick, wavy hair, he makes an exceedingly pleasant impression. The childishly smiling face always makes my heart happy. And I have to say that this is not the boy that he's describing, but this is uh, his own foster son, um, Joseph. <coughs> 
Now it's it's worth noting here that um, like Augusta Lüwop in her description of Kamala's arrival at the mission station, Viggo Müller dwells on the um, on how Samuel affected him emotionally, describing not only the boy but also his own emotional inclinations. What made his heart happy was the childishly smiling face. So in in other words, a quality that was specific uh, to the child. And like other missionaries, uh, Viggo Müller uh, took in foster children. Here is one picture of Joseph, and here is Viggo Müller with his wife, and their two foster children, Joseph and Paul. And this was becoming more common. The articulation of affection toward children can be found in the writings of male missionaries as much as in those of female missionaries. So they were all equally keen to describe themselves as infatuated with the children and as tender and loving toward them. So how should we understand this new cult uh, emotional culture of the child? In the colonial world, intimate feelings like love could, and affection could have diverse and ambivalent effects on the power dynamics of specific relationships. Literary theorist Ligla Gandhi has argued for the importance of recognizing friendships between colonizers and colonized. Such relationships, she argues, effectively destabilize the colonial order which was reliant on notions of fundamental and insurmountable difference. As anti manichaean friendships defied colonial divisions, intimate feelings, she argues, could efface or at least diminish inequalities. But it would be too simplistic to assume that intimacy or love across the colonial divides automatically and unambiguously counteracted the logics of colonial rule. As Auguste Nuhoff's language of possession indicates, the emotional labor of love helps shape relations of power in much more complicated ways, potentially making the loving and loved person vulnerable in a different manner than when more hostile emotions are at work. Love and tenderness could be over empowering, but it could also be overpowering. Kamala, whose family situation had been highly unstable to say the least, may well have been disinclined to reject her new foster mother's desire for emotional intimacy. But how she felt when Augusta Nuhup took her away from the family she'd lived with since she was a baby um, and cut off, and out of love cut off her long curly hair, for example, is hard to gauge. Mission historian Claire McCliskey has also cautioned against two hasty celebrations of love as a missionary strategy. She writes, Evangelical love could take many forms. Constraining, compassionate, controlling, unreciprocated, and even on occasion violent. And just as the intentions of this love, as for all forms of love, were not always selfless, its outcomes were often far from benign. We have a missionary preaching to village women, perhaps preaching evangelical love. Love and tenderness do not always diminish difference or inequality. At times it can have quite the opposite effect. As affect theorist Sarah Ahmed has pointed out, love has a way of creating boundaries between those who are deemed to deserve the affection and those who are not. These different insights then prompt us to ask about the kinds of social identities that the new affective culture nourished in the Danish mission community. What inclusions and exclusions did the new love, uh, culture of love engender? In one way, as I've pointed out, Indian children were welcomed into a universal category of the child, but this did not mean that racial traits were entirely effaced. Indeed, the missionaries often underscored the importance of maintaining the difference between Indian and European children. Unlike their own biological children, their Indian foster children and the children in the orphanages and boarding schools were to be raised according to native customs and practices. Following this line of reasoning, Augusta Nuro also made sure to raise Kamala like the natives. I raise her as far as possible according to Indian ways. She is dressed like a native Christian, her food consists mostly in rice, she eats with her fingers, naturally on the floor, and she sleeps on a mat. As far as I've looked into Indian circumstances, I find it most proper to raise her like her own people so that she will not become an alien to it. And here you can see a picture of Kamala with other missionary children, 
um, and I'm afraid the quality isn't great, but you can see that Kamala is the only one who's barefoot, and she's wearing different clothes than the other missionary children. So there's a maintenance of these subtle signs of difference between the different categories of children. As Augusta Newlop's comment suggests, an important reason for maintaining the children's Indianness was that they should not become foreign to their own people. This was in part because the missionaries envisioned the children as little bridges to heathen society. If the missionaries could establish an emotional intimacy with these children, and the children would then go home and tell their relatives about the good Christian missionaries, they might help them save even more souls. The children would in effect become little missionaries in their own right. Augusta Nirov also emphasized Kamala's role as a link to other Indians. She says, Kamala goes to school now. She is growing and is still a source of great joy and encouragement. I believe the Lord has used her as a little chain between the natives and me. <coughs> Which one is called Kamala? Kamala is here in the middle. Okay. Yeah, so she's the oldest child. Mm -hmm. Missionary Est uh, wife Estel Huff was also very explicit about the desire <laughs> and attempt to create such bonds as she wrote that she and her husband liked to invite the boarding school boys into their bungalow. She writes, so that hopefully, through a little kindness, we could win their little hearts and perhaps forge a link to them and their homes, which could attain significance for life. Our hearts long for the wisdom to be something for them. The education of Indian children according to native ways and the promotion of, a partic of the particular bodily practices that this entail presumably happened out of the best intentions. But the distinctions it helped maintain were a constant reminder that at some point, when the Indian child grew out of the childhood category, he or she would become an Indian adolescent, and then eventually an adult who no longer automatically deserved missionary love. Gradually, the cuteness would decline and the significance of the racial status would increase. The inclusion of Indian children in the missionary's emotional community was, in other words, temporary. Another important feature of the tender childhood category was the critique it prompted of Indian adults. When the missionaries portrayed themselves as being particularly fit to care for Indian children, they did so in explicit contradistinction to Indian parents. As heathen and morally corrupt people, according to the missionaries, these parents tended to either love their children too much or too little. Either way, they got the emotions all wrong. Rescuing the children from adults who failed to raise their children properly and who would teach them heathen ways, therefore attained a heightened moral urgency. The boarding school, uh, the boarding school boys. Missionaries there increasingly sought to displace Indian parents and take over the care of Indian children from early childhood on. They established new orphanages and new large boarding schools like this one. And like Augusta Newop took, uh, took in Kamala, other missionaries also uh, began to take in foster children and raising them in their own homes, like their own children. Now, they didn't forcibly remove the children from their parents, as has been the case in so many other contexts. Rather, they relied on persua persuading the parents or families to get hold of the children. Nevertheless, some Indian parents found it necessary to steal back their children in the dark of the night presumably fearing an uncomfortable confrontation with the missionaries. And uh, boarding school for girls. In the early 1890s, the home board of the Danish Missionary Society in fact criticized the missionaries' practice of removing children from their parents, expressing their misgivings about the unnatural separation imposed when, and I quote, the children are torn from their parents and become a different class of people than they. Missionary in the field, Nils Peter Hansen, however, felt impelled to stress the necessity of this practice. As he wrote, I regard such a separation as a completely essential condition for laying a Christian foundation in the children. The continued influence in the home would be an almost absolute obstacle for such work. And here you see Nils Peter Hansen with his own family in South India. And they, like many other uh, missionary children, were in fact also uh, separated from their parents as they were shipped back to Europe. Um, so there's a kind of dual displacement. But that's a different story. Most missionaries concurred with Nils Peter Hansen's view of Indian parents' detrimental influence. 
In another example, the matron of an orphanage, Johanna Lindeborg, suggested that it was actually better for the children to die than to live with their own parents. Describing the agony that she'd felt when she was forced to take leave with a boy whose heathen parents had come to reclaim him from the orphanage, she commented, It's sad to see the children die, but this was much more sad, for our little boy did after all return to heathenism and darkness, while those who die go to the light. And she actually wrote this right after another little child had died, but the, she was much more sad by the fact that a set of parents had reclaimed their son from the orphanage. That was the worst destiny in her, in her view. And here's a picture of her. Oh, she's on the left. That's the orphanage. Similar portrayals of Indian parents as harmful to the children can be seen in the illustrations to the missionaries' publications. So here is a picture of a mother sacrificing uh, her son to the gods by throwing, throwing him into the river where the crocodiles are waiting to feast on him. And this picture was actually from a British missionary publication, which was then reprinted uh, in a Danish book for children. And um, that happened a lot, that images and stories were kind of circulated between publications across national borders as well as within um, different national contexts. You see the same stories over and over again in the same pictures. Um, yeah. So, uh, and the next picture is of a, a laboring child widow who also who was also meant to illustrate the kind of sad fate that children would enjoy if they remained in heathenism, or and particularly girls. Um, and then I also just uh, included this picture to show that not all of them were that condemning towards Indian parents. So this seems rather to play in a sort of universal maternal love. Um, so the missionary discourse is like any other discourse where it's sort of multivocal and you have both images and um, sort of stories that undermine the mainstream message that the missionaries wanted to convey. In many of the missionary writings, one can detect a dual movement, a criticism of Indian adults' ways of relating to children and a simultaneous self-assertion. Take, for example, this quote by a missionary supporter who described the work of missionary Helga Lamlau, who ran an orphanage in the village of Tirukoyilur. She wrote, Imagine how good it is for all the little homeless children that they can meet love from Jesus. Those who have suffered so much and are often sick and exhausted when they are brought there by their mother or relatives, if, that is, they have not been picked up on the country road where the mother has thrown a little girl because she caused her trouble. On the one hand, this quote is about the inadequacy of Indian parents and adults. It's about their carelessness and callousness, and about how children suffer in their care. On the other hand, it's about the missionaries themselves, about their capacity to feel compassion, about their love for the children, and about their grace and selflessness. In this quote, Helga Ramla sort of stands as the mediator of both maternal and divine love. And this is Helga Ramla with two assistants and four children, and you can see that the boy in the front was unable to stand as still as you're supposed to if you want to be, uh, if you want the picture to be sharp. Um, and this is, these pictures are a little later, uh, also from Helga Ramla's orphanage. In this manner, the missionaries' own ability to see children as innocent beings in need of care is a sign of their moral superiority vis-a-vis -vis Indian adults. Social historian and historian of childhood Linda Gordon has pointed out that, and I quote, one of the most transcultural markers of what historians call modernity has been an ethical or at least a discursive prioritizing of children's welfare. Now this marker is a highly politically charged one Postcolonial scholars have argued that the woman question became a way for colonizers of measuring civilizational progress of a society. And Europeans like to describe civil, uh, colonization as a mission of saving the colonized women from the colonized men. This can also be seen in the Indonesian context, where missionaries often wrote about the horrific conditions under which native women lived. But I would argue that the project of rescuing children was every bit as important. <coughs> To rephrase Gayatri Spivak's famous formulation, Danish missionaries presented their engagement in India as a question of white adults saving brown children from brown adults. And back to Kamala. 
And she was one of the children who got to experience this rescue mission firsthand. By the age of six, she had had four different families. Her biological mother, Sister Sara, the first missionary whom uh, her mother brought her to, her native foster family, and then Augusta New York. And the trajectory of shifting sets of parents continued for Kamala. In 1907, Augusta New York returned to Denmark, leaving Kamala behind. Later reports of the girl's whereabouts are infrequent. But in 1916, missionary Anne-Marie Peterson wrote that she had now temporarily taken over the care of Kamala from another missionary wife, uh, Helene Bittman. So these were her fifth and sixth uh, mothers. Anne-Marie Peterson informed her readers that Kamala now attended the Free Church Mission School in Rajapuram, and she added, Kamala is a good and dear girl, but with the schooling she has quite a job. When she was here during Christmas, we accidentally talked about having talents. She said that her teacher had said that everyone had one or more talents, but she could not see what her talent was. She who found everything so difficult. And Marie Peterson had tried to make her understand that talent was not necessarily a capability. Was it not, she asked, a gift to be a Christian girl in the land of the heathens? The girl's weakness, the missionary concluded, was that instead of participating in the classwork, she'd merely observed the others and had been miserable that she was unable to follow. Oh well, Anne-Marie Peterson concluded, it is, after all, not so easy to have so many and yet no real mother. <coughs> Kamala was presumably still enveloped in missionary love, still considered good and dear. But as Anne-Marie Peterson acknowledged, becoming a child of the missionaries and being the object of their love could nevertheless result in a difficult destiny with unstable relations. And this is the last picture that I've been able to find of Kamala. She's standing directly behind Anne-Marie Peterson now. Not, not, no longer the chief uh, object of portrayal in these photos. Um, and as far as I can tell, she gradually slipped out of the missionary archives after this. So to conclude, Missionary love and affection for children defined the missionary community in a specific, emotionalized way that included heathen children, at least temporarily, but did so in part by excluding their parents, defining them as non-members of their emotional community. Childhood then was not just a temporal period where social identity was shaped in the children. How adults thought of, felt for, and interacted with children also became an important parameter of identity. The Indo-Danish case compels us to consider the role that transnational interactions such as these played in the formation of the modern sentimentalized notion of childhood, even within the Western world. So visual and textual representations of the lovable Indian children and the child-loving missionaries circulated across Europe and North America at this time. The Danish missionaries were prolific writers, and their tracts and books reached a large audience within Denmark as was the case with missionary publications in some of the national contexts as well. From 1890 to 1920, there were between 10,000 and 40,000 members of the society in Denmark who supported the mission work economically, but at least as importantly, who helped, who were recipients and mediators of their message um, to the Danish public. The local branches of the organization in Denmark arranged meetings, uh, readings, prayers, sermons, and lectures as well as bazaars and other activities aimed at raising funds for the mission work. The society held more than 200 missionary expositions, which were visited by thousands of people across Denmark. In combination, these activities, along with the many publications, reached a wide audience. <coughs> the mission also directed many efforts at winning the hearts of children in Denmark. In the first decades of the 20th century, they published several magazines and books for the young audience, and organized sermons and children's clubs aimed at bringing Danish children into the fold. And just um, to give you this last picture, this is the front cover of a juvenile missionary magazine, and it's called The Little Missionary Messenger. And this heathen boy is saying, come over here and help us. So you, these were kind of appeals to the Danish public, and in particular to, to Danish children. Through such publications, for both children and adults, and through other ways they reached out to uh, the other the, the other ways in which they reached out to the Danish public, the missionaries in the field and their supporters conveyed a message about the world outside of Europe. As such, they had the opportunity to shape the worldviews of the Danish public 
as well as to teach the public about ideas and practices of childhood outside of Europe in different cultures. Now, in Europe and North America, scholars have suggested that gentleness toward children became a sign of middle class identity, especially in contrast to the working classes, who only later adopted the concept. Although we can never quite prove uh, what causes cultural change or how new concepts of childhood emerge, I think we need to extend the scope to look at non-European contexts like South India to understand how this new notion of childhood was worked out, not only in contrast to domestic working classes within Europe, but also through comparisons with racial and religious others. This Indo-Danish case compels us to consider what role this concept of childhood played in the making of modern Europeanhood. And finally, I think it, it calls for um, consideration of what role these loving projects of saving innocent brown-skinned children from the perils of their religion, culture, and society played in the portrayal of imperialism as a fundamentally necessary and benign endeavor. Thank you. I think we will open the floor to uh, questions and you will feel the results. whether you came across um, missionaries talking about marriage for these children eventually, you know, the idea that you know you convert them, you become Christian, and then who could they marry? They didn't have their ties to their natal family. Right. You would typically arrange that. Were the missionaries going to take on that duty? Like, what how, what was their sort of long-term <laughs> plan for these kids? Yeah. That's a good question, um, and I think it, in the early in the early 19th century, when or earlier, like in the sorry, in the second half of the 19th century, early part of my period, um, when they always when they baptized all of the children who came into the to the mission, um, then they would take on uh, the arrangement of marriage as well. Um, so and they would make sure that it would be a, um, a another Christian person, the person that the child was married to, and actually. At that time, they had the parents sign a contract saying they wouldn't try to take the children back. So uh, one way for parents to do that, to get the children back, would be to um, uh, to not do that before they turn 16. So one way for parents to snatch the children back would be to uh, marry them off to a heathen person and uh, have them uh, sort of uh, when they went home on, on holiday. So that would be kind of a, a way of protesting the, the sort of bond that missionaries tried to create. But later in the period, they didn't baptize all of the children, and some of them would eventually go back to their families, so that they would, um, that, that, that in that case, the parents would take care of it themselves. With the foster children, they did, however, arrange marriages and, and give dowries as well for the, for the, for the girls. So it's so a different practices at different times. Um, I have a question about I was first of all fascinated to hear that a lot of missionaries sent their own children back to Europe. But the picture of the one Danish girl in one of the photographs um, made me think about sibling relationships and what sort of um, what sort of uh, emotional regime was constructed between white children and, and these missionary children if white children were present enough for that yeah. to happen. It is my impression, I mean, the little traces that, because the missionaries didn't write that much about their own children, they mostly wrote about, because, I mean, at least in the private archives they may have, may have written more, I haven't consulted that many of those, but, but it seems, I mean, when they write about the, their children, they say that hardly, they hardly spoke any Danish, so it's my impression that the Danish children would most of the time, um, you know, be with their native nannies and play with, you know, the children that were around, until they reached the age of school, at which, at which point they would be sent back to Denmark. So they would definitely play together. Children <laughs> must have been a rough adjustment. Yes, and they would they would be placed with you know friends or family that uh, they obviously hadn't met before. Um, so yeah, and there were some really heartrending stories of those departures. You know when they when they you know say goodbye to their children. And some of them never see their parents again because they die in the colony or whatever. So. Sorry, um, I don't know who came first. Yeah. I have a question about the chronological parameters of your study. And I'm coming from a, a position where 
I know far more about United States foreign missions in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, first question about the parameters, I, I guess the general question is why did you choose the mid-19th century? I know that there were Danish, Danish mission, uh, missions in South India as early as 1706. So, so why do we start mid-19th century? Second part of the question is, I recognize many of the practices you're talking about as practices and attitudes that were common to United States women missionaries in the, the second decade of the 19th century. So what do you see as being distinctive to the period that you're looking at? Right. I think, thank you for the questions. Um, first of all, the reason that I uh, chose the late 19th century is that, that this is a time when the Danish Missionary Society set up their mission in South India. So you have uh, the German uh, mission uh, missionary, uh, Siegenberg, who was sent out by the Danish king in the early, 19th, uh, early 18th century, as you say, working in, in Tarangambari, which was then the Danish uh, colony. But my interest is mostly in this period. So. And then there wasn't any mission uh, for a long time from, you know, from the mid 19th century, oh sorry, mid 18th century and then up until my period. So I, I'm just interested in that period and that's why I chose, and plus these were, you know, there were many more missionaries and uh, who did much more work at this time. And I think, you know, you're right that a lot of these practices uh, in terms of the, the gentle, uh, you, which practices are you referring to? So the, the, the one that was most striking was um, the strategy of appealing to parents to enroll the kids in schools yeah. because the parents were far more likely to do that yes. and the missionaries were using that as a way to get at the parents. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, uh, I mean, you could probably, I, what I know from other British missions and other European missions in India and elsewhere, you're right, those practices were there all the time. So, and, and also in the Danish mission, they did seek to get the children away from the parents already in the early period of my study, so from the 1860s onwards. Um, what changes is mostly, I think, the ideas that they have about these children, about the possibility of actually converting them, because um, it was a sort of paradox, really, in the 1860s and 70s, that they kept saying, these children are more or less irredeemable, they keep disappointing us, you know, and then they still spend all these resources trying to, to, uh, to raise them and educate them and take them away from their parents. Um, so I think what, what is distinctive about this period is the sort of idea that uh, children become lovable, or indigenous children become more lovable and more uh, like European children. I think that, I think, at least in my case, there's a, there's a, there's a marked uh, sort of development in the ideas that they talk about the children and in the ideas, in the, in the ways that they describe their practices with the children once they're in their care. It would be interesting, I think, to lengthen the time span because um, in the early 19th century, I think, missionaries tended to see all children as corrupt. Yeah, uh, because, exactly. Because the, 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 the theology was all inflected by Calvinism. By the mid 19th yeah. century, in some, in some scientific way. racism kicks in, yeah. and and it sounds like what you're talking about is a slight move away from scientific racism to a kind of cultural racism. Right. I think I think that's very true. I mean, I think even in the early 19th century, they do. I mean, the Danish missionaries weren't that affected by, or the Danish community that wasn't that affected by Calvinist thought. So original sin hadn't been that deep in the Danish line of thinking as it were in many other contexts. Um, but, but even when they, even at the time in the late 19th century when they, they you know, oftentimes also describe Danish children as corrupt, there was always, you know, another layer of corruption to the Indian children. So there was always this emphasis of difference, you know, um, which they, I mean, which they still practice later on, but they kept trying to, you know, efface it in their language <coughs> saying that, you know, they're all the same and equally cute and so on. So, yeah, I mean, I think that is a big change. Yeah. Okay, so I'm fascinated by this idea that, okay, we begin the, ch the in the later period, era anyway, the children are um, now seen as lovable and innocent and all that, but the parents are not, because these children, as you alluded to at one point, are going to grow up and become the parents. So what, how do the missionaries now see those, the, the children that, that were the innocent children, Presumably, they've had the training to not be heathens anymore. Right. 
So how does the emotional response to those children, like Kamala, yeah. how does that change? Yeah. And why does that, if it does, why does it change when those children become adults? You, uh, are those, are they, as adults, are they now considered in the same category as their parents were? Or is there some, like, middle ground that yeah. they occupy? Or? Yeah, it's, it's my impression that there is a sort of middle ground for some of them. I mean, some of them end up, you know, because when they, when they sin, uh, when they're still adolescents, that can still be forgiven. That can still be an expression of their, of their you know, their children or youth, and, and it's forgivable. <laughs> but once they start doing that, when they've grown out of the childhood category, it's no longer excusable. So, so you know, you have some of these children who grow up and don't become what the missionaries want them to do, and they're condemned just like all other adults were. Um, and then you do have a few who stay within the mission and who become sort of in that middle ground. They're not the equals of the parents, and even if they, or, or of the missionaries, you know, if they are employed by the missions, um, missionaries, which some of them were, they don't get paid the same, you know, and they, as, as um, the white people did and so on. So there's a constant, you know, maintenance of distinction, but they weren't necessarily criticized as badly as uh, the heathen parents uh, or the heathen adults were. So some sort of middle ground, I guess you could say, yeah. I don't know who was first. <laughs> Um, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, now that you mentioned a few points that sort of complicate my question, um, especially if you mentioned that uh, parents, uh, the missionary parents didn't like much about their own children. So I'm going to ask about the idea of love with children mm -hmm. and how you know, the intersection of emotion, emotional uh, love versus and waste. So I'm just I'm wondering if there is, I don't know, I'm wondering if the missionaries saw themselves, they have their idea of love as artificial regardless of, you know, the custom, the way, the differences among the children, and yeah, it's still really well differences between the two children, which I've got the practice about, like, oh, the Hindu children do that, the European children do that, mm -hmm. I'm like, nothing positive or negative about it, but still, it's still drawing differences, mm. so it almost seems like this day they talk a lot about love, but it doesn't seem unconditional and maybe they it think seem, they do. It doesn't seem what? It like unconditional love? Okay, yeah, no. Can you sort of uh, elaborate on so that? So that the love for the European ch or their own children is a different kind of love than the love that they express for the children or the image? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, I mean the idea of the missionaries to be unconditional in their ways. Yeah. So, um, I guess I'm still not uh, fully convinced of it when no. they are, I guess, uh, those civilized, mission to civilize yeah. Hindu children. In terms of how they felt for the children, whether that love was unconditional for the Indian children, um, I think that's really hard to measure because what we have to go by is, you know, what they said. And they had this really strong ideal, or they, they, they developed this really strong ideal of love. So even, you know, although they may have been very, you know, torn about a lot of things, that would not be what they would write back, because they would sort of try to align themselves with this ideal of love. Um, and of course, yes, you're right, they do draw differences all the time. And in terms of their love for the Danish, or their own children, you know, when they do write about the children, it's usually in relation to the departures, and then, you know, they, they talk about the love for the children, or their, you know, the way that this love is becoming homeless when the children return home. But you know, they left their children to be raised by native nannies a lot of the time. So, and they also, you know, were willing to ship them back to Denmark, even though that was hard for them. So, I, I'm not sure that you can ever measure whether something is unconditional, or that you can ever, you know, gauge how they really felt, so to speak. But what you can talk about is, you know, the kinds of like emotional ideals that they sought to live up to and that they promoted um, and that they tried to practice themselves. Does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, I mean, I mean the truth, uh, the answer, so they see themselves, not just earlier said, uh, and, and in between, the children and God, and uh, I mean, that they probably just need to have separate in their own uh, emotion versus from their own work. I mean, maybe they do, because God tells them to do. Yeah, yeah, that that seems very likely. That yeah, I mean that's for, they're called by God to do that, so they have to make a lot of personal sacrifices. Yeah, and 
I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't. Not, not fun. I mean, I, I like it's a new paradigm, like uh, race, religion, and emotion. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, actually, this is sort of a follow-up to what what Sarah, I think, was asking. But I was I was struck by the term, and I think you used it, of sort of missionary love. And what is the specificity of missionary love? And I think in one of these quotes, there was love of Jesus, as opposed to other forms of love. But right. and maybe as they're articulated, you know, toward children, toward Indian children, mm -hmm. you know, by non missionaries, <laughs> so right. the secular forms of love. In other words, not not comparing Danish, yeah. you know, love parents with love for their own children versus, but sort of comparable forms of, uh, you know, comparable targets of love, but by people who are outside of the sort of missionary. Right. Because I've been wrestling, I've been thinking, you know, what is specific to sort of missionary yeah. love as opposed to yeah. other forms of yeah. love? That's a great question, and, and I'm sorry if that's what no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, what I, part of the reason why I think that the missionaries helped promote this ideal and they didn't just reflect what was going on outside of the missionary world is that from the beginning they tied it so directly to the love of God so that at least these missionaries did. There was a sort of development in the mission where there was an increasing emphasis on the emotional intimacy that you had with God and that in order to become a true believer, you had to love God and you had to have this constant open intimate dialogue with God. And in order to convert children uh, to do that properly and not just uh, to make rice Christians as you know, they have this uh, concept of you know, people who converted without having the intimate relationship with God, uh, they, their, their hearts had to be one. You know, so winning the hearts of the children was sort of tied to a theological project of you know, loving or creating a sort of a, 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 a sort of bridge of love to God. And so they saw themselves as mediators of divine love, and that's what sort of made them invested in this idea of tenderness toward children. So I think that, um, you know, a, there's probably a lot of comparable language outside of the mission work, but I think it might have been stimulated to some extent anyway by, by these ideas within the Christian uh, community where, you know, salvation was dependent on, on love in a way. Thank you again for your, for your talk. Um, a kind of a two-part question. One, what is the relationship of the Danish missionaries with the British colonial state? Um, and I can kind of, I mean, historically, obviously, um, British Anglican and Evangelical missionaries had a fairly ambivalent relationship with the state, both yeah. in the company and craft period. Um, so I can envision a lot of sort of legal entanglements with Indian families and, and these missionaries. And then two, to what extent are the Danish missionaries sort of interacting, I mean, what's the language of instruction, what's their sort of orientation towards um, uh, you know, Indian culture within Madras presidency, because certainly the, the British missionaries are very active in translation projects, and I wonder, this is a way of asking, to what extent is, are they engaging with kind of local languages of affect? Right. Yeah, um, that's, that's a great, that's a, those are great questions. Um, so, in terms of the relationship to the to the uh, British state, of course, at this time, it was very kind of conflicted, um, and I think, uh, especially uh, in the late nineteenth century, there were a lot of conflicts. So, they, in order to uh, get uh, support for their schools, they had to have government recognition. So, they had to invite an inspector out every year to check the schools and to examine the children and then they would get support. But that also meant that they had to teach subjects and give less priority to religious or to uh, theology than they would have liked to. And they were critical of the British state, <coughs> but then they were also dependent on it for uh, financial reasons. And then increasingly, I think, they actually became more and more supportive of the state, so that the t of the colonial state, so that um, when they were required to write this, um, uh, what do you call it, the declaration of loyalty around 1920, Nearly all of them did, and then you have a couple of missionaries who refused to do that because they were anti-colonial, and they ended up splitting with the society and actually establishing their own mission and becoming friends with Gandhi and so on, who then helped them, you know, lay the foundations for the new school. So you do have, you know, a lot of. I mean, it was a variable and often conflicted relationship, but eventually, in the end, you know, I think they decided to remain loyal to the state in order to be able to operate. Um, and the language of instruction was Tamil uh, in all of the schools. I, I don't think in their high schools, but in the 
day schools and um, you know in their uh, boarding schools. So um, so they did you know try to engage with local culture in some ways, but because they were so, and I think they probably did more so than is reflected in the sources because there was this constant need to um, sort of distance themselves to uh, indigenous ways um, and heathen ways. So um, you know they they had you know they had any you know uh, um, and. It's 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 what's that called? Or it's, well, they had an interest anyway in, this, in distancing themselves from yeah from um, from the local ways. But I think they definitely did engage much more than this than this necessarily reflected in the sources. And then I do also think that there were friendships, and of course there was mutual influence. Um, but when they when they presented you know what they did to the Danish audience, it was very much about we are coming with this uh, sort of the truth and are you know mediating it to the poor lost heathen. So mm -hmm. that was the message that they wanted to to bring across, certainly. But I'm sure that they have been much more effective than mm -hmm. effective than you know than they would admit <laughs> to. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I was thank you for such a thought provoking talk and I was wondering what the mission looked like. And I, I asked for a couple of reasons. I, one, I was wondering, in what ways did their understandings of, of love shape the physical environment in which they lived and worked? But I was also struck by how often in your quotes, the way you talked about it, you know, home and foreign, home and foreign come up so often. And mm. missions are always these kind of interesting places where people leave a home country and then try and recreate it in a new place, but they're dependent on people and resources in the new place. So I was also wondering, to what extent does the mission look like Denmark, and to what extent does it look like India? <laughs> And then the final question is, to what extent does it look like, um, you know, home has a special meaning when it comes to child rearing in this context, so to what extent does it look like a, a home, and to what extent does it look like a, a workplace, because right. missionary work is, well, labor. Sorry to, mm. yeah. Great questions. Um, so the home, I mean, the mission bungalow itself uh, was built in most of them sort of local, uh, like, um, you know, uh, big bungalows, the way that the British would build them. Uh, and inside there would be furnished like European homes. Um, so in that way, what they did was try to kind of recreate this image of respectable living. Because they figured that, you know, the home is both uh, um, the, sort of the source of heathenism, because uh, it could be, you know, in local society. And then it, it can also be the counter image of what goes on, you know, with the sananas that are kind of impenetrable, with their, um, and, and, you know, the little gods in the Indian homes and so on. So they would create sort of an atmosphere that would be a living contrast to that, for oh. sure. Um, so it was very much against going native in their own sort of living. Um, and they also, you know, were very keen to teach Indians to um, build homes that were respectable, especially the ones that converted. They would help them build houses and make sure they didn't just sleep on the veranda and so on. They had to sleep, you know, oh. inside the home and, you know, have a place to cook and another place to you know, do, do different things. So I think the home was definitely an important tool and image of either, you know, heathenism or respectable Christian living. Um, and they also built churches that look exactly like they did in Denmark and so on. Um, and sorry, you had one more question, didn't you? Uh, well, I was also asking me this asking, to what, to what degree do, do their, their thoughts about love, did it shape the oh, actual yeah. environment? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a really great question. I haven't, I haven't looked the, you know, at, at the materiality of their practice so much, and I think that would be a great project to look into. But I do think that in terms of creating uh, possibilities, so toys, for example, it's not a, you know, a space, but it's a ma new, new material objects that came into the mission when they suddenly saw children as able to play, or the Indian children as able to play again. Um, so there are different material practices connected to it, but I'm not, I'm not sure how much it changed, you know. Um, oh their uh, physical environment, but it would be really interesting to, to look at that. One thing that I noticed, and that it may have been done for practical reasons, but a lot of photographs take place in gardens on uh, porches, and right. right, that may be lighting and so forth, but, but they, those spaces may have had particular resonance for the relationship between the adults and the children. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, she does, I mean, the, the missionaries actually often emphasize taking, at this time, you know, after the culture of love has come to prevail, so to speak, that taking the Indian children into the home. So, so that's an important oh. sort of practice for them in order to teach them both about you know, Christian living, but also to establish that sort of intimacy. Oh. So it might be that you know, 
the, the veranda of their own home is, is one place, but then I think you might be right that the technical, you know, the, the lighting and so on is part of the reason why many of the pictures are taken outside. Because that goes for the missionaries themselves as well, you know, when you have portraits of just them. So, but yeah. Thank you. Um, my question is sort of similar to that, and also a two-parter. Um, so, I'm wondering if, how common it was for the missionaries to um, to foster children. Was that the norm for every, every you know, adult missionary, uh, either woman, man, or couple, um, to take in one children, multiple children, etc.? So that's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, if, it seems like that would be uh, difficult given the number of children at these um, orphanages or, or homes or whatever, whatever we're calling them. And and so I'm wondering, um, what kinds of consequences would that have for the uh, emotional community among Indian children themselves mm. at a mission? There we go, mission, we'll call it that. Um, for for some of them to, to live in the in the you know intimate sort of family style home, yeah. or or not, where were the other children right. sleeping, for example? Yeah. You have such great questions. Um, the, uh, I think, you know, in the early 1860s, 70s, hardly any missionaries took in foster children. So they had these orphanages, but they were very clearly demarcated from, or very clearly separated from the missionary bungalow and so on. And then you, um, then towards the end of the century, when Sister Sarah was the first, so Kamala was the first foster child of any missionary. And then after that, more and more missionaries did. But it's my impression that probably half of them took in foster children. Some of them had their children of their own, which were who were then sent back home to Denmark, and others uh, didn't have their own, didn't have children at all, uh, biological children. So they took in foster children, um, and uh, either married or unmarried. Uh, and and as in Kamala's case, there were more or less unstable relations. So um, you know, they're um, not necessarily exactly. Uh, sort of long-term family sure, relationships, yeah. and I think you know, I, I don't have any evidence to 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 say anything about you know what was the relationship between the different Indian between the, those who were foster children and those who weren't. Um, but because the missionaries were so adamant on you know creating intimacy with many children, you know there might have been a lot of jealousy. It's not yeah. it's not um, it's not unreasonable to believe that. But then it might also be that. Some children preferred to have their own families uh, or their their biological families, and so we're not, you know, and some probably had neither. Um, so you know, it's a, it's something we can speculate about, sure. but it seems yeah. It's so hard to so there weren't for uh, like I'm thinking sort of a, our typical image of an orphanage, like several children sleeping in a room with one supervisor. Mm. It was it wasn't so children were either with with a foster a Danish foster family or with their biological individual. No, no, I mean in the boarding schools and in the orphanages they would have supervisors sleeping okay. with them at the school or in the orphanage, yeah. Okay. In the orphanage I think there were quite a few, like usually there were a few native women sure. employed to take care sure. of them, or the missionary would stay in there with them at night as well sometimes when they were sick. Okay. That's what they were Can, I, can I ask a follow-up question? Um, I guess you probably would have mentioned this, but I'm also wondering if the missionaries who, you know, have left these archival traces are, talk about concern about d developing love between the children themselves. Yeah, that's, no, I haven't come across that, okay. but it's a great, but they do, what they do talk about, I mean, is that they love to see, the, well, they don't talk about developing it, but they, they cherish it when they see it, okay. you know, and they also like when the children express love for their own parents, because okay. it's a sign of their capacity sure. for love, you know, which is, should be celebrated, even though those relationships should be torn, you know, or at least yeah. some of them believe they should. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Do you know anything about um, what the missionaries did when these children uh, got to marriageable age and what they did to marry them off or try and influence whom they married? Yeah, I mean, some of them, um, it, it, towards the end of the century, uh, those who were not converted would not be taken care of in that respect. But. Um, one, to, to, towards the end of the century, they would begin to, uh, uh, but, I mean, the foster children, they would definitely always arrange marriage for them. Um, and you have one, one of the missionaries, Sister Sal, who was the first independent female missionary. With her uh, orphanage, she would, um, she would uh, train them in housewifery and so on, or at least that was her ideal. So when, when they, it came to, when they 
came to the age that they were supposed to be married, she often like remembered that she'd forgotten to take properly care of that. She was kind of a progressive in terms of women's issues and more interested in building houses and so on than in actually creating a domestic atmosphere inside them. Um, but but for most of them, um, you know, they when they're in their own, own care, they would marry them off and give them a dowry if they were girls and um, and make sure that they would be married to another Christian uh, boy or girl. Um, would and this usually be someone else from the mission, or would they either from the same mission or from a different mission station? So the the mission was spread out all over South Arcot and even in Madras. So even they would even marry them off to someone from the same or different mission station in, within the Danish mission, or even within the Swedish or Norwegian or British mission. So just making sure that they would be Christian. Yeah. And so they didn't care much for denomination after that then. They would have to be Protestant for sure, because <laughs> they hated the Catholics. They were like the big competitors. But, but yeah, no. In terms of you know that would, and they would socialize very much with the other missionaries in the hill stations during the hot months. Yeah. So they would you know get to know each other quite well. Do, do you know anything about what age? Like if we're talking about girls, well, boys too. What age is age range where they usually when they were married off? I think around like 16 or 17 was, you know, they tried to postpone the, the age of marriage as much as possible, but then they would have to still be marriageable material, you know, they couldn't be old. They, yeah, they wouldn't have to. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I just had um, another question. I was thinking about the broader context, not just shift is taking place. So it's, the first thing is happening right when the campaign you know, against atrocities in the Congo is, is, you know, enormously influential. And so this is often dated as the first humanitarian campaign internationally. And I wonder, in, in those atrocity photos, which missionaries in the Congo, you know, and I don't know if Scandinavian missionaries are also involved in the, in the lantern slides, and the, the, so the images are very important. And there, there are children, you know, with their hands cut off from this, uh, from this campaign, and I just wondered if, you know, again, it's sort of humanitarianism and, and love, are they also informing each other at this mm -hmm. moment, and would these, would that be part of the context which explains a kind of the shift, shift to, yeah. uh, also to a different, you know, more sentimental view of right. children, or... Yeah. Know, it seems very likely. I think it's certainly a lot of the same things going on in, in to humanitarian discourses and imagery, and I, and I think even today, you know, at least, I mean, coming from Europe and having followed the, the refugee crisis there, this mm -hmm. very often this idea that we need to save the children, mm -hmm. you know, whereas, you know, the adults are potential terrorists, and there's this constantly, constant marking out of children as someone, as, as a group that deserves protection and care, but the adults are always sort of, yeah, potentially dangerous to mm -hmm. us, and, and within humanitarian discourses too, this tends and the tendency to focus on the deserving children and sometimes women. You know, when you look at you know uh, humanitarian campaigns in general, um, trying to raise funds, it's this this you know ninety percent I think of the pictures will be of, of poor children who need or, or children going to school or deserving children in some way. So I think I don't know where it's you know it's hard to say exactly where it started. I think it's starting in many places and then feeding into a, you know general development. But I think it's definitely the same thing that's going on was and still is going on within humanitarian discourses, is my impression. And just, the, just one, Nancy Hunt has argued that in those images, often the sexual abuse of women has been screened out. I right, mean, both at, at, yeah. at, at, at the, yeah. so this that's sort of, the erotics of love yeah. versus yes. sort yeah. of maternal yeah. love, I think that's a very interesting yeah, possible tension yeah. to explore, yeah. to, you know, the way these different forms of love are competing for, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, a, definition. Yeah, Thank that's you. Great, great. I'm so sorry to have to close the conversation, but we do have to relinquish the room because there's another speaker coming in here. So let's say thank you to Karen and thanks for being thank a great you. audience. But thank you.